I'm going to just start with a um, quick story. This was uh, with my daughter probably about 10 years ago. Um, she wasn't feeling well, and so I took her down to an urgent care in our community um, that happened to be the same community here. And it was clear that it was a busy night. This was probably somewhere between 9, 10 p.m. or so. Um, as I mentioned, she probably ended up being an ear infection, as I recall. But we showed up and got into the urgent care, and it was clear that it was busy there. Uh, waiting room's really full. And, you know, I thought to myself, this is going to be a fun night. And um, get in there, get her checked in, look around, trying to find a place to sit. And I see a woman um, with her, looked like maybe a teenage daughter, where the daughter was clearly not having a very good night. She was sobbing. Mom had her arm around her, trying to help console her. wasn't working really well. And we sat next to them. And... After a moment, you know, the mom looked over and kind of gave me that glance that only a mom can, that I wish I was anywhere but here tonight. And I, you know, as a father, kind of felt the same way. Um, any rate, she leaned over and said something that's actually had a pretty profound influence on how I've come to think about our industry in terms of how data, information, and technology should and could be helping to enable it, okay? So she leaned over and just said, why is it so hard to get the care that you need. And, um, and she kind of went on and qualified that a little bit to say, I didn't know if anywhere else was even open tonight, this time of night. I didn't know if I should have gone, taken her to the ER. I didn't know if my insurance is going to help cover this or not. I didn't know how busy it would be here. I don't know how much I'm going to end up paying. I'm not sure that I'm not still going to end up in the ER tonight, okay? And I think we can all empathize with, with that. We've all kind of been in that same situation, either for ourselves or, or with a loved one. And I gotta tell you that it hit me particularly hard that particular evening because A, I worked for the organization that owned and operated said urgent care. And second of all, I was the leader of our e-business team at the time that in theory was helping to make a, these kinds of experiences a little bit easier for our patients and for our members of, of the um, community. So I kind of took that as a call to action. And I've, and I've got to tell you, from that time, I made a personal commitment to myself that I was going to do everything in my power to help not only the organization I work for, but as an industry to help us figure out what we can do so that we can start to come up to parity with other service industries that have got this a lot more figured out. And what is it we're talking about? It's really this digital enablement and interaction type of a model that, that we see everywhere else in our lives, but we are still kind of struggling with here in healthcare. Um, so with that, what I'd like to do is just take just a little bit of time, because I, I think we kind of understand the state of, of digital, mobile, et, et cetera. Um, I think we inherently understand, um, you know, with us working in healthcare, that, that we are lagging. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about that, okay? Instead, I want to talk about maybe some of the reasons why we're lagging and what it is that we can do to get a little bit more crisp on what we could be doing as we go forward to help enable each of our organizations to be ready for this big digital barrage that is coming to our industry. We're starting to fill it a little bit, but this is something that has completely disrupted virtually every other service-oriented industry. Um, I'll, we'll then talk just a little bit about some lessons that I've learned the hard way um, along the road of both being an IT leader and a digital business leader at both Intermountain Healthcare and at Banner Health. And I'd like to share five specific um, tips, recommendations, lessons learned, whatever you want to call them along that way. And then we'll take time to just cover a little case study um, at Banner Health where um, I'll share how we implemented a portion of this framework. The framework's kind of broad, so I'm gonna look at just a piece of that, and I think you know, that'll make sense when we get there. And then, as Nancy mentioned, we'll have some time for Q&A. So, what am I hoping you come out of here with today? You know, first of all, let's understand, you, you know, A, that we're lagging other industries, but kind of why it is that we're lagging. Second of all, um, we'll identify this digital enablement framework, okay, that's a multifaceted, um, type of a model. Third, we want to review tactics for how we can enable digital within our organizations. And then fourth, um, there's a power in partnerships is what I'll call it, okay? And I've learned, again, the hard way that we can't try to build our way to everything. We can't do all the systems integration work ourselves. 
things are moving too fast. The speed of business is simply moving too fast. And if we as technology leaders, information leaders, data leaders, et cetera, aren't there um, in a way that we're able to embrace and, and develop really core strategic partnerships with other vendors and other third parties, we're going to fall behind. So I think it's kind of an immutable fact that you know digital, that we'll define in a moment, okay, but let's keep that a little abstract here for a moment, in a lot of ways is kind of like gravity. It literally just permeates virtually every aspect of our life um, at this point. And, I took, you know, in preparation for, um, you know, this presentation, decided to look at, these are all of the apps that I interact with either on a daily or at a minimum, at least a weekly basis, okay? Apple Screen Time, that new um, function kind of helped me put this together, by the way. Um, and as you kind of look across these brands, something dawned on me, um, you know, with the exception of let's say McDonald's on there, maybe Fidelity down by the bottom left, or Bonvoy, which is Marriott's new brand, um, Cinemark maybe. Um, most of these brands, digital is their only way of delivering their service to their customers. And isn't that interesting? Despite the fact that these brands still represent just other service-oriented industries. But some of these brands, you know, like Delta and like Marriott and like McDonald's, far predate the digital age and had business models way before that. And yet they have figured out how to transform themselves to the point where Ryan Smith is using their app to interact with them and do a lot of self-service, which I find way more convenient, incidentally, and way more efficient, and a lot of times far more cost-effective than interacting with their traditional um, you know, service and support models. I'd like to think you're all in the same boat as me. So the bar has really been set by these other service um, industries, whether we're talking about hospitality or financial services or transportation, maybe it's retail, maybe it's the food service, uh, you know, it could be gaming, whatever the case, everybody has disrupted themselves. And as part of this, we've seen a lot of consolidation in these other industries and there's winners and there's losers. And a lot of that is by result of these highly disruptive, highly innovative, um, you know, digitization aspects of, of where these organizations and, and where these industries are going. And, you know, we won't spend a lot of time here, but our industry is a little different. Uh, a lot of times, you know, we'll uh, commiserate with one another saying, well, we're different than every other industry. We're a lot more complex. Truth of the matter, we are uh, more complex. But we still tend to kind of think of things in terms of how we reach out to healthcare consumers, to patients, and to members digitally in terms of probably an EMR, uh, you know, vended portal or their app, okay, that still tends to fairly be branded by them. There might be standalone apps that our organizations also offer consumers to do things like maybe specific, you know, prescription refill kinds of things or some kind of wellness type thing that, again, we as organizations buy them from some vendor and just put them out on, on the app stores and ask our um, you know, patients and consumers to go out and download those and interact with us. Well, that would be pretty akin in this day and age if your bank offered you know, a separate app for looking up checking and savings accounts and a separate app you know, for investment stuff and a separate app for your mortgage. You, you would clearly be going to a different bank if that was the case. And so you know, in, in a lot of cases, these you know, some of these other service-oriented industries are a good 10 years ahead of realistically where we are and where we need to, where we need to be. So I'm gonna turn the time over to Matt for just a moment for our first poll question. Thanks, Ryan. Question one, on a scale of one to five, how would you rate your organization's effectiveness in meeting consumer expectations for digital interactions? Take a few seconds to put in your votes where one is not at all effective and five is extremely effective. Let's take a look at what's coming in. And looks wow. like the majority of people are saying two, somewhat effective. What do you think of that, Ryan? Okay, interesting. So I did a webinar a few weeks ago on, on the same topic and um, pretty similar results. So the one thing here that's um, not a surprise at all is that a lot of us feel like, you know, we're just marginally scratching the surface here. I, and I get that. And there's a lot of reasons for that. 
I am really pleased to see, though, that that extremely effective um, is starting to raise. I, I think in the webinar I did is around 10% of the organizations felt that, that they're doing a really good job there. And so there are clearly bastions out there, beacons of, of light of organizations that, are, that have gotten it. And quite frankly, they didn't just get it yesterday. They probably got it five, 10 years ago and started a pretty concerted path to, to getting there. Um, so thank you, uh, appreciate that, Matt. And, um, one thing that's pretty clear, um, you know, transformation is one of those big buzzwords these days in most of our organizations. And what I'm showing here, these are four examples of, of how organizations a lot of times think about or, or put in, um, you know, transformation buckets, the type of initiatives or strategic themes they're trying to pursue. And these ones here are representative of what we had at Banner Health, at least of, of a, uh, you know, a year ago or so when I left. So engaging healthcare consumers, enabling care teams, improving clinical and operational outcomes, and growing the organization. Each of us, um, as corporate service leaders at Banner Health, as well as facility C-suite, um, you know, operational leaders, needed to figure out how we would align you know, to these strategic themes and help, in essence, to, to enable in our own way what the company was trying to, to reinvent itself as. And, and so, along with my IT leaders and our digital, mar or, sorry, digital business leaders, here's what we came up with. Things like, well, as it relates to engaging healthcare consumers, we'll provide an engaging self-service experience giving consumers full access to the necessary data and services to pr pr promote health, wellness, healing, et cetera. And you can kind of read across there in the ways that, that we said, here's how we're gonna, going to try to connect to these um, you know, different strategic themes and, and uh, you know, vision of, of the company. But to do that, it really takes a new approach to how we think about investing in technology. If your organizations were like our organization, um, just from a technology spend alone, if you look down there towards the bottom in that red area is the systems of record, which by the way, these are the high transaction, high volume, um, inward focused systems, those back office systems, you know, like Epic, like Cerner, like Lawson, like PeopleSoft and Infor, dot, 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 um, that, that keep the business humming from a digitization per perspective. Um, that probably accounts in many of your organizations for 90 plus percent of your overall technology spend. And then we're just playing around the edges with things that would really make a, a, a big differentiated experience for, again, consumers out in the community, your patients, your members, et cetera. And so we started to take a, a decidedly um, different approach to where we wanted to start as, as kind of a five-year goal to say, here's where we want our spend to be. We want to try to ratchet down those systems of record to about 65% of our spend. Well, how do you do that when it's already, say, high 80s, 90 plus percent? Because um, you can't just start turning off systems, obviously. So that's part of the framework we'll talk about, is how do we save money down in these lower areas? How do we get to higher levels of integration that allow us now to begin to invest as a C-suite team, as uh, you know, board of directors, and making decisions on enabling these systems of differentiation, and then ultimately um, having, you know, at the tip of that iceberg, systems of innovation. Now, if you'll notice the relative investment life cycles of each of these, you know, down there at the bottom, we're talking 10 to 15 to 20 year major capital investments, and we all know that. Anybody that's gone recently, you know, through a major EHR implementation, et, et cetera, these are big, multi-decade kinds of investments. But these systems of differentiation, these tend to be SaaS delivered, you know, more subscription-based, OPEX kind of models that their life cycles are probably more in the three to five year um, time frame. And then these systems of innovation up at the top, now we're talking about six to 12 to 24 month life cycles. These are fail fast, learn fast, implement fast kinds of things. This could be a, a mobile app. This could be you know, some kind of you know, voice integration thing. This could be a chat bot. This could be augmented reality something or another. And you see what sticks and, um, and, and we leverage those things. But like an app, obviously if you're not constantly refreshing that, it becomes irrelevant very, very quickly. So this was an approach that we took um, with an overall distinct 
that we are going to buy versus build whenever we can. And we're going to start putting a lot more of the onus back on these uh, you know, handful of fewer strategic vendor partners to figure out system integration work amongst themselves so that our teams don't have to do all that so that we can start working up the food chain a little bit more and working on more interesting things. So kind of put another way, here's what the digital enablement framework kind of looks like. You know, if you look down there at the bottom, you've got your infrastructure, you've got your systems of record there in the center bottom, you've got all of these data sources coming in. Now what it is, is we start making really conscientious um, choices and decisions around these systems of differentiation and innovation up at the top by getting you know, a data system in place for being able to really aggregate and doing meaningful things with data. As you can see, sort of pointing out there to the right, you know, running your BI, your analytics, et cetera. But as importantly, to be a foundational data layer for supporting this digital process layer up above it. And these digital process layers can have direct ties both to the data, but also to a lot of workflow, whether clinical, um, billing, rev cycle, et cetera, you know, even back into um, you know, contact agents and things like that, back into those line of business systems, but completely abstracting that experience to those end users that we express through this application interface layer up at the top, if that makes sense. So what this allows us to start doing is to really start to control our own destiny in terms of how we use those behind the scenes abstracted systems and data that, by the way, aren't architected for direct consumer interaction with them, right? That would put way too much load on those systems, et cetera. So we have to have ways to um, abstract that out. So how does this kind of play out in the real world? Well, let me just show a quick example at Banner Health. Um, so if the Banner Health app here that was released, I want to say about a, you know, maybe a year ago, which was really its first foray into a fully integrated um, you know, consumer digital type of an experience so that consumers can come into this type of an app and with single clicks can do some really interesting things. And back to the story that I started with, now imagine, you know, if you could rewind 10 years back, this poor mom, you know, with her teenage daughter, what if she could have talked to a nurse with one click of a button and, and said, here's what my daughter's feeling? What if she, at, the, at her fingertips, had access to what is the nearest urgent care, is it open, and what are their available times? What if she could just click on one of those, like you can do here, and immediately be in a virtual, um, you know, get yourself in line virtually before you even leave your home so that you're not spending as much time sitting in a busy weight room? What if you could start getting some of the other information you need and, and even doing pre-check-in types of processes? What if you could actually find providers based off of how you think about finding a provider, not how we think you want to interact with us? So. These, these are just some examples of how you can start bringing it together. Over on the right there, you see an example of a separate app, completely different brand, but a completely different audience. This is an app that was built for um, athletic coaches to help do quick assessments of their uh, you know, team players that they suspect may have suffered a concussion and what to do about that. So this is all fine and dandy, but this is really hard stuff to, to put this together um, you know, given what we have to work with behind the scenes in many of our organizations, because this kind of stands in the way, okay? This is sort of the proverbial decades and decades of monolithic systems, data silos, all bound together by all these HL7 interfaces, so data is everywhere, systems are everywhere, business logic is everywhere. And that makes it really, really challenging to start to get a fully integrated app, you know, that, that a healthcare consumer, a patient can use that can begin to interact with the breadth of these systems back behind the scenes. We literally in our organizations have, have typically only just scratched the surface by maybe, you know, we're giving patients access to a portion of their medical records. Maybe they can request an appointment. Maybe they can even schedule an appointment. They can probably pay, a, pay their bill. But you know what? It doesn't go very far beyond that. And I was just thinking the other day using the Delta app. I'm, I'm a pretty loyal Delta um, flyer. And I rarely ever have to call Delta. I can almost do everything from that app, you know, from researching and finding flights, looking at cost, you know, booking a flight, changing a flight, changing a seat, checking your bags, following your bags. I mean, it's just everything happens through there. I'm sure that that's a huge efficiency to their business model as well from a cost savings perspective, but more importantly to their customers is it builds loyal customers. And, and that's what we've got to start getting to. 
And so with this mess that a lot of our organizations have in the background, as we start really thinking about, okay, how can we go digital? Well, here's one way to do it, okay? And, you know, I'll tell you, 15 years ago when we started at Intermountain Healthcare, this was literally our only option, okay? We had a, a large heterogeneous environment, but we were serious about starting to scratch that kind of consumer demand. Clearly, this was before apps on phones and things like that, so this was still in the age of just you know, browser interaction and things like that. But we had to put on you know, a really complex outer, outer layer, as it were, that was already on top of it, was you know, in reality kind of a brittle infrastructure to begin with. And you add those two things together, and that doesn't equal stability, scalability, et cetera. It's just more challenging. But it was the only option back in the day. So I'd argue that there's a better way. And again, it's not gonna happen overnight in our organizations, but, but if we can start to think more holistically about how we can clean up that mess behind the scenes, it's going to really make it possible for us to begin to be a lot more agile with keeping up with, with um, you know, the business that we're here to do. So here's, our, here's some tips. Okay, first of all, we really need to formally define what we're talking about when we use the word digital in our organizations. And here's my tip, okay? If your organization defines digital as any of the new technology stuff, all the shiny bells and whistles, the exciting stuff, and that's digital, and that's the investments around that, and IT is this stodgy, old, boring, keep the lights on, uh, you, you know, maintain and support the legacy environment. Well, as, at least as technology leaders, I'd tell you, I'd be really concerned about your future in the organization. This is not a definition of digital that we want to be pursuing in our organizations, and we have to really go on the offensive. So here's what I've used, okay? For better or for worse, the innovative meshing of new technologies, data intelligence, reimagined workflows, organizational leadership, all aligned to achieve a sticky and optimal experience, inviting end users to virtually access all relevant information while offering a breadth of interactive, self-service capabilities available anytime, day or night, using any preferred device from any connected location. Kind of wordy, okay? But I used a version of this definition at Intermountain Healthcare and further refined it at Banner Health, and I'll tell you what, even though it's a little bit long, it actually just ends up being succinct enough and stated in such a way that even non-technical folk can kind of get their arms and heads around and say, I think I get that. I understand where we're coming from. Um, and, and so, you know, you're, you're gonna, your mileage may vary, but the important part is, let's define what digital means because you know what? It's a major buzzword still. Um, and if I pulled each one of you aside and said, what's your definition of digital? We'd probably have that many definitions of digital as we do have people in here to, to an extent. So we really do need to get crisp around what we're talking about. Um, and by the way, even though I'm kind of talking more about that direct to consumer digital model in today's presentation, this definition spans audiences. So this is equally effective whether we're talking about an internal provider audience, an affiliated provider audience, your own workforce or team member audience, et cetera. This isn't unique to just consumers out there. Um, second of all, develop strategic guiding principles for enabling digital. Um, as I mentioned, you don't move from a mess like I showed on that chart, um, you know, with all the spaghetti heter heterogeneity um, to moving to something that's far more streamlined overnight. In most cases, with a really concerted effort, we're looking at five plus years, in reality, five to 10 years to really get our you know, back-end technology in such a state that it can really, truly enable um, what's going on digitally in, in a really uh, much simpler way. And so I laid out some guiding principles that I thought were really important that would help to dictate and drive virtually every technology decision that we're making. And that if we could uh, kind of subscribe to these kinds of, um, I'll call them North Star guiding principles through our procurement processes and our build versus buy decisions, should we bring in vendor X or vendor Y, dot, 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 that if we would follow these things, it would systematically help us keep inching forward towards having you know, an infrastructure and a technology base that could really support where we're trying to go in the future. Now, you may not agree with every one of these, um, but I feel pretty strong about all of these, okay? Um, so let's, let's move to uh, you know, our second poll question here. And Matt, turn it back over to you. Thanks, Ryan. 
So again, this is session 26 and question number two. If you haven't already gotten in your votes, please take a second to do so now. Question is, on a scale of one to five, how well is your IT infrastructure, systems, data and technology architecture positioned for enabling full digital capabilities in the short to midterm future? That is in the next 12 to 36 months. Your options are from one, not at all positioned, to five, well positioned. And let's go ahead and start to look at what's coming in. It looks like the majority of people in the room are going with two, somewhat positioned. Uh, though we do have quite a few who are also saying four, moderately positioned. Love to see that, okay. It's really exciting to see that four and five well positioned. Again, notice that five corresponds pretty well. I wouldn't be surprised if it's the same, you know, eight to 11% of you that, that said from a digital interaction perspective, you're, you're doing really well, okay? So again, you see that as an industry, we're on this really broad spectrum. And I would argue that we've been given a lot more latitude and forgiveness by healthcare consumers than any other service-oriented industry from a time to deliver digital capabilities. A lot of reasons for that. But I think as we all understand, you know, as we're moving more to value-based care, as we're moving to high, de you know, high deductible health plans, and that first dollar spend is coming out of your pocket now instead of your employers or the governments, um, it's getting a lot more imperative to understand that healthcare consumers have choice. And once they have choice, it's a lot easier for them to start deciding to go wherever they want to go for care a lot less allegiance to specific doctors, to specific facilities, et cetera. And if we don't build in this stickiness and this brand loyalty through this really tight service experience that's not just throwing technology at it, but it's reimagining all of these clinical and business workflows that we have as well to help support it, then we're going to become increasingly disenfranchised from what our consumers want and it's easy enough for them in mo many markets to go across the street. Now we can hedge that for the time being to some extent, you know, with commercial payer contracts and a lot of other arrangements, but I think we all see, you know, where, where this is heading. Okay, so next, let's talk about number three, which is positioning around portfolios. So I have this model um, that I like to divide technology basically into 10 portfolio areas. And the point here is not just to drop them into buckets, but it's to get laser focused around the strategic roadmaps for each of these areas and the intersection between each of these portfolios and how we govern them so that they are moving and being managed strategically towards an end goal, okay? And it's not just adding more and more and spending more and more, et cetera. It's being really concise and driven about these. And a few of these, you know, clinical suite, revenue cycle suite, business ad admin suite like ERP, we all kind of understand and already manage those like portfolios today, but what are we doing around data management and analytics? Is that just a bolt on, you know, to a bunch of other systems we already have with sort of a loosey-goosey strategy, even with governance, et cetera? Or is that something, you know, that we're really treating like a strategic business asset and managing it as such? And I'd argue we need to do the same thing around a consumer digital suite. We have to be really calculated about how we're, we're um, approaching this. And I talked a little bit about governance, but um, I, if, if there's nothing else you take away from today's presentation, I'll tell you the, the most important lesson I've learned in the last 25 years is to build these business-driven IT partnerships through a, a true dyad kind of a model. And I won't get into the mechanics of all of this today, but basically, in a nutshell, it's identifying for each of these portfolios, as well as for each major IT investment that's happening, um, that you build this dyad model where you have a really strong business or clinical sponsor or champion that doesn't report up through the CIO or in any form or fashion in, into IT, that's really the face of the initiative, is the face of the portfolio, um, you know, and, and then you pair that person with kind of more of the Robin type persona that's an IT champion. And the IT champion may be doing the bulk of the work behind the scenes and has 100% of the budget, but the point being is you get this partnership going and you get it going strong to co-chair governance committees and things like that, now you've got two people sitting there at the executive team level. You have two people sitting there at board meetings saying the same thing of what we need to do. And it's pretty interesting what that changes from an investment paradigm when it's not just the technology leader saying we need to do X, Y, and Z, and it feels disconnected from what the business is trying to do. 
Um, next, let me just share a quick thing around developing an analogy. What does that mean? Well, a few, few years ago, I was um, preparing for a big board meeting presentation and around this digital enablement framework, and the CEO asked me to meet with one of our board members first and to um, kind of run the presentation past him and, and get any you know, feedback. And he gave me some feedback saying, you need to kind of boil it down, come up with an analogy or some way just to make it simpler. And so I came up with this, par this analogy around a, a solar system, okay? So here's kind of what it looks like. Um, around each of these, you know, 10 portfolio areas, the thought was, let's select a core IT partner, okay, that becomes kind of the sun, the center of the solar system that everything else kind of revolves around. And what we want to do here is develop this really strategic partnership with a vendor that has a fully integrated platform that hopefully is also a modern, open, scalable platform, okay? But sometimes that is just that, it's a hope, okay? But in theory, that, that player would be able to offer 60 to 80% of all of the capabilities, business or clinical capabilities, that the business needs out of that particular IT suite or portfolio. Second of all, we then identify secondary IT partners that are basically certified integrated partners of that core vendor partner. So in our case at Banner, the sun for our clinical application suite was Cerner, okay? The secondary, you know, Saturn, Jupiter, whatever, Earth, would be companies or organizations like Nuance and 3M's coding products, et cetera, that had a very tight integration with, with Cerner products so that our team didn't have to do all of the all of the duct work, basically, and all the plumbing. And then rec rec recognize that even with the secondary IT partners, you still only end up with maybe somewhere in the 90% um, needed capability for that portfolio. So then and only then do we have a handful of non-strategic HL7 interfaced other vendors to fill some gaps, okay? And what do we do with everything else? What do we do with the other 20, 30, 40 vendors and apps that we have out there that are currently in that portfolio? We get rid of them, okay? And there's a lot of change management associated with that. But when we talk about how do we get from 90% of our spend in those systems of record down to 65%, this is how you do it, okay? Um, so here's what it looks like when you extrapolate out across you know, all 10 primary IT portfolios. Again, you, some of these portfolios can clearly be from the same vendor, like revenue cycle and clinical apps in this day and age. However, I'd argue you probably want to still govern them fairly separately, if that makes sense. We've talked a little bit about strategic vendors. Um, basically, bottom line here is when we're talking about a strategic vendor, um, we're not talking about the standard vendor-client relationship, you know, where we're trying to exact a pound of flesh out of them from pricing concessions and they're trying to just charge us more and more. In fact, we're not even talking that next level up at just a supplier um, supplier client uh, where maybe there's some shared uh, you know, cost goals, things like that. We're talking about true partnership where they've got our back, we've got their back, we're in it for the long haul. One test of, of the relationship is how often is an actual metric do we have to pull the contract off the shelf each year and, and go back and you know, look at what the contract says. If that's one or more, we're, we're probably failing from a strategic partnership perspective. Um, there's some risks in putting all your eggs in one basket, um, you know, taking this type of approach. Uh, you know, for example, you've got more eggs and fewer baskets. We've got a greater reliance on partners. It can have some impact to your existing job roles, et cetera, as you're doing less of that plumbing work and let your folks kind of free up more for, for I think, doing more meaningful work, et cetera. There can be a lot of change management involved, you know, with vendor change outs and things like that. But at the end of the day, this is generally a really good problem to have, okay, to take this more integrated approach. So how do we apply the model? Um, I'm just going to look at one area. So if you think about those 10 portfolios, I mentioned enterprise data and analytics as a suite, okay? Um, we won't have time to cover all 10 models, all, uh, or sorry, all 10 portfolios, obviously, but let me just share a little bit about how we have tried to approach this at, at Banner Health. And it has its own fits and struggles, okay, as C-suite leaders change in and change out and things like that. It's hard to have the, all the same continuity. But in essence, you know, we're, we're, we're talking about this level here, kind of this data, uh, you know, this data system layer. Um, and as I mentioned before, that's driving both, you know, your analytics, your, your improvement and things like that, that a lot of us have tended to think about this area, but it's also a 
really fundamental piece going into the future for driving that upstream digital enablement as well. So at, at Banner Health, you know, one thing that um, we introduced early um, was this healthcare analytics adoption model. It's actually a prior version of this when it was um, still just eight levels. But we positioned this as sort of the vision of where we were trying to go, also using it as a measuring stick that we could use year over year to say, how are we doing progress-wise? How are we doing down at these bottom layers? How are we doing up towards the top layers? How do these upper layers expand out from just clinical improvements to also things like you know, financial and other operational or patient experience improvements to boot? We wanted it all be in there. Then, you know, back to the solar system analogy, we looked at, you know, we want to build this on a strong governance kind of a foundation. And as we were kind of um, defining what would our ideal strategic vendor partner kind of look like, well, ideally, and I'm using that word generously, okay, because again, no one vendor can do it all, right? But is there, can we get in that 60 to 80% level that we talked about that could, you know, 60 to 80% ingest any type or source of data that we need to be able to use? comprehensive data management um, around that, you know, to be able to run machine learning algorithms against this, can support NLP, can, um, you know, curate, can do all the things that, that ideally would be able to do. Can we publish it into any modality that we need to, to publish insights? And then finally, what about getting these insights back into clinical workflows in the EHR? How about revenue cycle workflow? How about, you know, back in front of contact agents, um, you know, where maybe their line of business system is CRM like Salesforce, or something like that, or even in front of IT folks that maybe are using service management, whatever. So this is the basic model, okay? We've only scratched the surface, and this is how we started to apply it for at least this particular portfolio at Banner. Um, and, and so what do we take out of today? Okay, a couple key lessons here. First of all, let's take some time to really define what digital means in our organization and help our teams our executives, our board members understand that this really is a journey. This isn't a one-time initiative, a one-time project. Digital, remember back to that astronaut coming down, it's pervasive, and as such, we have to start reframing in our minds what digital really means. And um, second of all, let's develop this innovative approach to how we think about investing in, in technology. And then let's build this business-driven technology governance structure and implement these dyad structures to really ensure full business engagement. And by the way, it really is a pragmatic way to drive what I'll call innovation and technology investment funding by C-suites and by boards. They, they get it when, when we can approach it with two or more of us saying the same thing. Then finally, recognize that building out these strategic key vendor partnerships is really key to keeping pace, being more agile with business needs. And for any of us that have tried to you know, completely own our own destiny, we know how hard it is to keep up with business pace and business demand. So that's, that's really kind of the end there. So let's take some time and um, see what uh, you know, questions the audience may have. Thank you, Ryan, for that excellent presentation. Thanks. All right, let me get up here. Okay, so the first question that pops up um, with the highest number of votes is, going back to the technology investment framework, the triangle, mm -hmm. what is the healthy budget split between the three layers? Okay, well, as, as you saw, um, the percentages we were trying to go after a banner, um, you could see those. Now, again, your organizations, based off your own appetites, are, are going to probably tweak those numbers somewhat. And, and by the way, that was more of a final destination um, vision for where banner was trying to go. So what I would recommend is, is that you look at it more in terms of, you know, probably one year, three year, five year, uh, you, you know, if, working with your CFO and others around how can we start to dial those in. One thing that's really important though, I'd say despite, you know, you know that proverbial putting lipstick on the pig, I would strongly suggest making a business pitch to go after some of those um, systems of innovation at the very top of the pyramid sooner than later, just to start getting you know, rolling up your sleeves, starting to get some experience of having a real digital like user experience um, person or team, ideally, 
having you know some mobile development skills, whether that's in-house or uh, you know outsourced, whatever the case may be, and trying to do some interesting things and go after something really small, like maybe Banner did around urgent care. Okay, don't try to boil the ocean but apply it to something that will be meaningful and you've got to put yourself in your consumers and in your patients' shoes in terms of what are their biggest pain points? How do we understand what those are? And is there something we can do to begin to tackle those? Because if you try to bite it all off, it's, it's huge amounts of investment that's just not going to pan out. We have to kind of take baby steps towards this. Thank you. What first steps can a federally qualified health center with limited time resources money uh, where most employees wear multiple hats and are already overburdened due to move from its basic archaic system to an app similar to Banner Health? Great question. And great questions oftentimes don't have a succinct answer. Um, I, what I'm telling you, what I've shown you today takes a lot of investment, okay? Like my wife always tells me, and I'm still trying to understand this, you got to spend a little to save a lot. And she's really good at that, okay? Uh, but I don't always see the savings. But, but at any rate, we've, we've got to figure out a way to do this. So, so if you're a, a smaller organization, um, you know, like the, the, being asked in the question, we've got to look at partnerships, number one, probably more leaning on our vendors, you know, to help us with this. And we may still fall a bit short of the vision, okay, of having something that's fully integrated at the end of the day. Um, because again, I, I found that you, you know these are some pretty pretty intense and and uh, you know both capital and opex um, heavy investments to, to move. The, you know, I'm, now Banner is like an eight billion dollar uh, you know net patient revenue kind of an organization, um, but nonetheless, it, these were still really hard decisions. You know, at the board level and at the C-suite level, trying to figure out how do we carve out money for these. So I don't have a great answer for this. It, it's it's really hard. So the next question is, what is the plan for the next five years for the application, for the Banner application? <laughs> um, yeah, so Banner, uh, we actually hired um, um, Intermountain's uh, digital business officer away, and he, not directly from Intermountain. He had another um, gig in between there. But, um, you know, he's, he's really, in a lot of ways, kind of running now with, with this vision. And so they're going to continue to stay very focused up at these systems of innovation level, okay? Um, and at the same time, they're really working closely in concert and harmony with the marketing um, department, really taking a lot of times to build out customer journey maps, and they're really, really cool. So they're looking at key customer pain points, um, you know, that evolve around access kinds of issues like, um, how do I get an appointment, okay? At primary care, specialty. Um, how do I find a location? How do I understand and pay for my bill, et cetera? And so there's all these journey maps that are defined that, that uh, again, have really strong linkage back into operational areas. Because one thing I can tell you that, that we learned really the hard way at both Intermountain and, and at Banner, if you don't involve operational leaders in this process that own the outcomes for those current workflows, whether they're revenue cycle, you know, things around scheduling, billing, registration, et cetera, or, you know, on the ambulatory side, you know, around throughput in our clinics, whatever the case may be, the initiative is going to fall flat on its face. We have to have that level of involvement. This, we can't, again, just do this all through technology. At the end of the day, we will get a lot of forgiveness as organizations, and like speaking on behalf of a large um, IDN, uh, you know, 28 different hospitals, Patients in those communities don't expect every banner hospital physically, brick and mortar wise, to look and feel exactly the same. That's not their expectation. Again, because you know these are on 20 plus year depreciation cycles and things like that. But when it comes to their digital interaction experience with banner, they absolutely expect and demand that it feels the same, whether they're going to any ED whether they're going to an urgent care, whether they're you know, interacting with a nurse on call, whether they're going in for an inpatient service, from a digital interaction perspective, they don't wanna have that um, you know, Banner University Medical Center experience digitally feel any different than a Banner Gateway experience, any different from you know, Banner Camelback urgent care. It's all gotta be the same. And, and so that means a lot of coordination and correlation with operational leaders across these different functions 
to figure out how do they make their operational workflows align with what the consumer experience is expecting digitally. So we've got to go way beyond putting the, you know, the, the lipstick on, on the pig. I hope that answers the question, but, but um, so Banner's going to just keep innovating towards having this one banner digital kind of a model, you know, at the end of the day. That, that's really what I think they're striving hard to, to go after. Looking for ways, again, think of it in terms of like how, you know, a Delta app or McDonald's or anybody else. How can they put, you know, digital technologies forward that both help meet what the consumer or the customer is really looking for at the same time that they're really dramatically transforming their own operations from an improvement efficiency perspective. We do it right, we win in both cases, okay, which, which is really, really key to digital efforts. Thank you. Can you speak, can you talk more about governance above the dyad level? Sure, yeah. Okay, so um, we weren't perfect at this at, at Banner Health, but most of these portfolios at this point, in essence, kind of have a dyad partnership. So if we think in terms of the clinical dyad, um, in this case, um, initially, it was me back in the day when I first started there in end of 2013, and we had literally 12 different electronic medical record systems, you know, from probably a dozen different EMR vendors. And we had this vision of, of again, core integrated partner, right? A lot of reasons for that, bringing data together, bringing workflows together, bringing clinical decision support together, dot, dot, dot. Uh, clinicians being able to see, you know, an ED doc being able to see that their patient it was just in a specialist last week or you know, PCP being able to see that her patient was in the ED over the weekend, whatever the case, and being able to share all that was really key. So when we very first, and that was the first portfolio we started with at Banner, uh, was that around that clinical suite. I functioned as Batman, or sorry, as Robin, okay? And our chief medical in information officer functioned really as Batman. Um, he reported up through the chief medical officer, okay, and I, at the time I reported up through the chief um, administrative officer, and we partnered as a dyad. Later, as that really got going and we started to get some of these other gears going around these other portfolios, I excused myself from that. I participated in, in the governance, but my VP of clinical applications took over as kind of Robin for that, for that clinical dyad, and the CMIO to this day still, still is really the, the Batman persona. Now, what happens above that level of governance? Well, different kinds of things. You know, there's an information management executive committee um, that, that kind of oversees data governance, dot, dot, dot. There's clinical improvement um, governance as well that both of these leaders are beholden, you know, up through those governance things as well. But they, the two of them, as it relates to that integrated portfolio, they are in charge of and accountable to defining what the long-term strategic roadmap looks like for that portfolio, making sure that it's aligning with what the digital goals and vision of the organization is, all the way through the execution of that, of that roadmap, okay? So they're on the hook to show up to the quality committee of the board and help, you know, say, here's what we've done, you know, to help clinical quality. They're on the hook to show up to, you know, different various committees that sit above them to explain how they're helping to enable and, and support. So yeah, there's absolutely upstream governance. And then they, co-chair, co-captain, um, you know, basically steering committees for, for their you know, respective area. Then I had other VPs that were over other areas that likewise had to partner with different business um, partners you know, for, for their dyad. So yeah, that's basically how it works. So it looks like we have time for a couple more questions. Do we want to take an audience question out here? Sure. Sure. Okay. Jim? We need a microphone, or if you, or if you can repeat. I'm sorry, where's the microphone? Go ahead and we'll have It's we'll a quick have one. It's, it's interesting you chose the CMIO. Like, I would have thought you would have said, uh, as the other dyad partner, it would have been uh, the head of RevCycle or marketing or uh, the head of the cardiology department. Right. And because the CMIO, a lot of people might not see as the true business leader. Uh, great point, okay. This was probably because his boss made it so. Oh, okay. Okay, so our chief physician executive, um, you know, basically said, Dr. Holland, you're gonna be the one that, you know, okay. that, that's going to do that. And then he, but again, you know, we had different executive kind of committees and things like that that, 
that he and I were you know, very much plugged into to kind of help keep things moving. But oftentimes, it is a C-suite member that absolutely is that Batman persona, absolutely. In the case of the digital, um, the, the digital consumer suite, chief marketing officer herself, and, and I was the other partner for that. So it totally just depends on what the needs are. Was there another follow-up question for that one? I thought I saw somebody else's hand raised. OK. Oh, it looks like one out right out here. OK. Do we, can we get a mic? There we go. Thank you. So I just had a quick question on the app experience, because I thought that was really fascinating how um, it's so different from banks and travel and everything else. Do you think the biggest barrier to getting that experience improved is it consumers not using healthcare apps? Is it the vendors not collaborating for the apps? Or is it hospitals not taking the initiative? Where, where is the weakest link? Or the Gosh, weak OK, link? so yes, yes, and yes. I think all three of those are the weakest link, right? But, but what we have not demonstrated in our industry very well yet are the healthcare organizations taking ownership and responsibility for their patients' experience digitally, OK? We, we have absolutely been content to say, Epic my chart. If we think about digitization in most healthcare organizations, we think about getting an integrated EHR in place, and therefore we're digitized, right? Oh, you know, and the CEO and others look at it like, well, yeah, just put their my chart out there. Now we're fully digitized. Well, we all know that that's just not going to scratch the itch. You know, that's a really limited focus from what, um, again, a healthcare consumer is really wanting. You know, again, back to the banking example, that's only like putting an app out for your mortgage part of the business, right? It's, it's not comprehensive. So we've got to take this more comprehensive view. We've got to continue as healthcare organizations, especially when we have these strategic partnerships with Epic, with Cerner, with others, to push them to open up their models, to open up their APIs, to open up their workflows, so that we can put these digital process layers over the top of them and abstract so that we don't have to have my chart that the patient is directly interacting with. Instead, they have something that's uniquely Banner or uniquely Intermountain Healthcare or uniquely Cleveland Clinic or uniquely dot, 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 um, where they might be a player behind there that's, that's helping with some of the information, workflows, et cetera, inside of your branded mobile app, and it's not their mobile app. That's kind of the point here. So it, it's a collective ownership issue, I, I think. I, ho I hope that helps to answer it. Okay, so unfortunately we are out of time. Um, I, again, I want to thank Ryan for his pre excellent presentation. Give him a round of applause. <laughs>